Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Animal Matters Commission for April 5th, 2021. Uh, before I get started and read the uh, the opening statements, we have some housekeeping. We have some new commissioners today. Welcome uh, Matthew Shyrock and Jennifer Branza. She, they're going to be our new commissioners. Um, so everyone else, basically, you know, I've explained to them, or I guess John McAndrew, I haven't seen you, Officer McAndrew. Are you, you filling in for uh, uh, Officer Ravenel? So yeah, I, yeah, I, yes, sir. I'm filling in for Lieutenant Ravenel. Okay, and this will be your first day attending the commission here. You've never done this before, correct? I haven't seen you in the last few years. Uh, I've done it before. I did it for. Oh, you have? Yeah, I sat okay, on the good. commission for several years. Okay, awesome, awesome. I well, welcome. Welcome um, back. So Robin can tell you it's probably about five or six years ago. I got you. that's about when I started, so I haven't seen you in a while. So, um. Basically, you know, generally speaking, I've already spoken to the new uh, the new members, but um, you know, as you know, we yeah. lost our commissioner, uh, and we need to basically we're going to need to vote um, to bring in a new commissioner. So in, in the past, um, you know, the, that that commissioner should have you know generally is going to be one of the citizen members. I represent the health department. We have a police representative, and then Dr. Uh, Chabalco is our veterinary representative. So usually, of the the remaining, we need to kind of vote uh, and bring in a new commissioner. So um, that's going to leave, in, in my opinion, you know, I think either uh, Ed or uh, Elizabeth would be would be fine uh, candidates to, to do that moving forward. Um, I don't know if you guys want to handle this today. Uh, I don't mind handling the, the procedures today. Um, maybe for next month, that, you know, when Elizabeth's around, maybe we, you know we can discuss it. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, why don't we wait till Elizabeth is available, and we then we can. Um, have both Ed and Elizabeth available to to go over the options That's, there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, isn't um I'm just gonna go ahead and, and read our opening and then we'll go ahead and get started with cases. So is everybody prepared? Here we go. So um good morning. You're attending the Animal Matters Commission hearings for April 5th, 2021. The Animal the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Animal Matters Commission was established and is conducted in accordance with the article with Article 12 of the Anne Arundel County Code. These are administrative hearings and by nature they are informal, which means you are not hampered by the rules of evidence. However, please be aware that you are still testifying under oath. Each party will have the opportunity to state their case. After each party states their case, they will have an opportunity to ask questions of the other party. <clears throat> please do not interrupt the other party. You will, give an, you will be given ample time to talk. In many cases, we are aware that there's a history. You may briefly tell the commission about that history, but please stay focused at the issue at hand. After each Thank case, you. the commission will have open door. Thank you. After each case, the commission will have open deliberations. During these deliberations, the public may not participate. If the commissioners have additional questions, you may ask. You may answer the question that is asked, but no further information will be heard, and a decision will be rendered. This decision is a recommendation to the chief of police or his representative. The recommendation of the commission will be taken into consideration and a final decision will be made by the chief of police or his designated. Did I just read that? I feel like I read that twice. Um, anyhow, so if any of the, if as a defendant in the case, you are unhappy with the decision of the commission, you may appeal. For citation cases, appeals are made through the District Court of Maryland. For administrative orders, uh, that would be potentially dangerous, dangerous or vicious orders. Appeals are made through the County Board of Appeals. Please call the first case. Our first case is Animal Care and Control versus William Dillon Jr. for the appeal of the vicious order for Lucy and the appeal of the vicious order for Odin, the dogs. All parties who wish to or have an interest in this case may step forward to testify and take the oath. Um, if you could, let's see, keep your right hand up. I think it's just Officer Simpson, we have a Mr. Dillon here. Officer Simpson, if you would please state your name and address for the record. Uh, yes, it's Officer Simpson, uh, 411 Maxwell Fry Road, Millersville, Maryland, 21108. Thank you, sir. Hang out for a moment. We'll get you sworn in at the same time here. And Mr. Dillon should be coming up now. Mr. Dillon, if you could please uh, turn on your audio and video. Uh, 
Mr. Dillon, I got your video up. I can't hear you yet. If you could unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you now. If you would please state your name and address for the record. William Dillon, Jr., 1113 Dykes Mill Road, Millersville, Maryland, 21108. Thank you, sir. And if you could both please put your right hand up. Officer Simpson. Thank you. Do you declare and affirm under penalties of perjury the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you both. You may proceed. Oh, good. good morning, panel. I'm just going to read from the record. Um, on January 29, 2021, Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Con Control Dispatch received a complaint regarding a severe animal attack. The caller advised that the attack just occurred about five minutes ago, and two, the two dogs described are a pit bull type and um, pit bull mixed breed, large white and an Akita type dog. Um, dogs apparently killed a cat named Big Boy, black and gray domestic short hair on the uh, cat owner's property. Uh, the caller further advised that the dogs were still running at large at the time. Um, January 29th, Animal Care and Control Officer DeSantos was dispatched to the complainant's residence of 1141 Dykes Mill Road, Millersville, Maryland, 21108. Uh, upon arrival, Officer DeSantos spoke with Daniel Stinchcomb, who witnessed the tan pit bull type breed dog and a white Akita type breed dog attack his cat, a short domestic, uh, excuse me, a domestic short hair, black and brown tiger named Big Boy. Mr. Mr. Stinchcomb stated that he was working on his shed when he heard growling outside, and Mr. Stinchcomb informed Officer DeSantos that at first he did not see anything, but he continued to hear growling. Upon further inspection, Mr. Stinchcomb found two dogs attacking his cat. According to Mr. Stinchcomb, the tan pit bull type breed had its mouth wrapped around the cat's stomach, while the other dog repeatedly lunged and bit at the cat's head. Officer DeSantos inspected the deceased cat's body and observed several punctures to the cat's torso and armpit area. There was also bark from a tree and leaves inside the cat's mouth. Due to the angle of the cat's head that it was positioned in, it appeared to Officer DeSantos that the cat's neck was broken. Mr. Stinchman stated he wanted to keep Big Boy and bury him in the yard. According to Officer DeSantos' report, several minutes later, Bill Dillon, owner of Lucy and Odin, arrived on the scene. Both parties advised Officer DeSantos that they are friends with each other, and Mr. Stinchcomb informed Mr. Dillon that his dogs attacked and killed his cat. Mr. Dillon advised that he was very sympathetic to the situation and informed everyone present that he was not aware of his dog's current location. Mr. Dillon further stated that he was out looking for them, but had not found them, nor had he returned home and likely, I'm sorry, nor had he, they returned home like they normally do. Officer DeSantis then informed Mr. Dillon of the county code 124402, which indicates that his dogs were to be impounded for being vicious and dangerous for killing a domestic, domestic cat. Officer DeSantis advised that Mr. Dillon Dylan, that once he finds his dogs, he will contact animal control immediately and bring them under mandatory impound, or that animal care and control officer would be back or be back the next day to pick the dogs up for impoundment. Officer DeSantos advised Mr. Dillon that it would be better for him and his dogs if he were to bring them into the shelter himself, as it would cause less stress on the dogs and his children. Mr. Dillon stated he understood and would call animal care and control once he found his dogs. Officer DeSantos then took photos of the deceased cat, as well as a witness statement from Danny Stinchcomb. 
all the information was turned over to Public Safety Office for further investigation. January 30th, 2021, Mr. Dillon brought his two dogs, Lucy and Odin, to Animal Care and Control under the Public Safety Act. Without incident, Mr. Dillon documented that he would be claiming both dogs. February 1st, 2021, Officer Herbert researched any prior incidents in the Animal Care and Control System and the police system to which there were none that were animal related. Officer Herbert then reached out to both parties requesting a statement of fact to be submitted to the Public Safety Office regarding the incident to which both parties advised they do not have internet or email. February 2nd, 2021, Officer Herbert spoke with Mrs. Nolan, Mrs. Nolan Lohman and requested a statement of fact to be submitted on how the dogs got out of the house. To which she responded, I was vacuuming the front porch and left the door open by accident, as well as inviting she does not have internet. On February 3rd, 2021, Officer Johnson posted the landlord's property at 1313 Jones Station Road, Arnold, Maryland, 21012. To contact Officer Herbert, Officer Herbert made contact with the landlord's son, Mark Simpson, and he advised the dogs could return to the property. Mr. Dillon and his family have rented the property of 113 Dykus Mill Road, Millersville, Millersville, Maryland, 21108 for 20 years. On February 9th, 2021, Officer Simpson received more, a more detailed witness statement from Danny Stinchcomb describing the attack as this. January 29th, around 3 to 4 p.m. at the address of 1141 Dykus Mill Road, Millersville, Maryland, 21108. I, Daniel Stinchcomb, witnessed an incident report. I walked outside to pee real quickly behind my truck out back. I heard a weird and loud noises when I saw what it was. It was those two dogs, one pit bull named Otis and the other bigger dog named Lucy. I thought they both had a raccoon in their mouth, but when I got closer to scare them away from the animal, I found out it was my niece's Amanda cat named Big Boy. So I got closer to scare the dogs away. I seen that the pit bull Otis had a cat by its mouth and the other dog Lucy had the cat by its face. Trying to shake the poor cat. The cat tried to get up a tree, but the dogs were too fast and ripped them down and broke the cat's neck. It all happened so fast and they weren't easily scared by me because they growled at me for making them go away from the cat. But it was over, they ran off into the woods and then I knew my dogs were gone. I knew I knew the dogs were gone. I got my niece and my sister, Candy, outside to tell them that it, that it all said he had got killed by the dogs trying to get away from the dogs, Lucy and Otis. I must say that there has been another situation where I saw a dead black cat on my driveway with those two dogs around the cat. They were off the leash running around when I tried to move the cat. The dogs growled at me. Another, in, another incident where my next door neighbor, Lewis, has seen two dogs trying to attack other dogs in the yard. Also from my house, the two dog owners are about 0.7 miles away. Those two dogs should have never stepped foot on my property also. Our animals never leave our property from our backyard. It's a shame that my niece's cat had to die and other animals for the, and other animals for the, them dogs to leave us alone. Another thing is those dogs are always outside running around our houses at all hours of the night, almost literally and never inside the owner's house. Signed, Mr. Stinchcomb. On January 12, 2021, I, Officer Simpson, served the vicious orders issued to the owner, William Dillard Jr. for Lucy and owner, 
in Odin under code 124402 public safety. On February 19, 2021, William Dillon Jr. submitted an appeal to the vicious order and served, the vicious order served on January 12, 2021 by Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control. As of March 3rd, 2021, Animal Care and Control has not received any affidavits or complaint nor written statement from any other than the complainant, Mr. Danny Stinchcomb. Lucy and Odin are currently in the care and custody of Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control, which brings us to this commission hearing today. All these events occurred in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. I do have a few pictures of Big Boy. If you could just, if you can see those, just let me know. These were taken by Officer DeSantos. We raise them up just a little higher. Yep. Is that good? Yeah, it's close. I mean, it's still tough to see. Yeah. I think we may have them in our packet. Okay. Yeah, you should have everything in the packet there. Thank you, Officer Simpson. Yep. Unfortunately, I don't have Mr. Stinch come here to testify to the fact that he witnessed the, the attack itself um, due to a medical emergency. Um, um, any of you, does any of the commissioners have a question for Officer Simpson about the case? Um, okay, uh, I just have one. Is it, were there any priors I might have missed? Were there any priors with either of these folks? Just, just from, just from Mr. Stinchcomb and his niece Amanda, we don't have any reported incidents in the in our animal control system. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Dillon, um, would you like to present. My dogs are always in the house or in my yard. They're never left unattended. That day they got out behind my mother's back. And I also, I've built a kennel with the floor and the roof. I can walk you outside and show it to you for keeping them to make sure that this doesn't happen again and they do not leave this yard again. Um, so are you aware that beyond the kennel, there, there's way that, you know, if we would even to consider something like that, you know, you're aware that there's way more than just the kennel that would need to be complied with, correct? Yes, sir. I also have the muzzles. And I can, whatever else that y'all need just to get my dogs home, I, I will be, I will do. Um, so do you, do you deny the fact that your dogs did this or do you, you just, you're saying this incident, this happened and this was just a mistake, one time mistake? Um, I'm not saying that they did or didn't do it because I wasn't there. And I mean, they got out unsupervised that one time. Okay. Is that all you have, Mr. Dillon? Um, I also have, we have a Maltese dog, a real small dog, and I have chickens and goats, and my dogs have never, never harmed any of them in any way. Okay. Um, how old are the dogs? Um, Odin is almost two. He's like a year and a half. And Lucy is about five. And how, how much does Lucy weigh? Lucy is, she's probably 60 pounds. And Odin? Odin, he's 50 to 60. Okay. Is 
Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Dillon? Um, just a couple. Mr. Dillon, um, is this the first time that you're aware of your dogs killing another animal? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the other question I have, it looks like going through the documentation we have, it looks like Lucy was originally adopted from animal control under someone last name Watson, I want to say. Yes, ma'am. That was my uncle who passed away. Okay. He left her to me. Okay. And she looks like a spade female coming out, uh, adoption from the animal control. Um, how did you get Odin? Um, Odin, my son got from from the breeder. Okay. And so he's yeah. an intact male um, and he's a year and a half, almost two, you said? Yes. Do you have plans to get him neutered? Um, yeah, and eventually. And I understand wait until they're, you know, fully adult and grown and filled out. And a lot of times that's what breeders recommend. So I, I understand, you know, his age at this point, year and a half to two years is kind of a prime time to get that done. I, I mentioned that because it's a known contributor for dogs that want to escape and roam and, and sometimes have um, these kinds of incidents and something that would be a preventative measure um, for that instinct for them to, to roam a territory would be, um, again, doesn't change his personality, but would help curb some of that drive that clearly we're seeing. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, the two of them, two dogs together can get a pack mentality. And I think that um, that might be something that we need to address as a preventative measure to, um, you know, prevent this kind of thing from happening. That was my only, my only questions was about, um, you know, where you obtained them and, and plans for neutering Odin. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Dillon? Okay, do you have anything else, Mr. Dillon? Um, just hoping that I can get my dogs and as soon as possible, that's all. Officer Simpson, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, I, I think one concern is that I think Mr. Dillon's already constructed a, um, he's talking about constructing a kennel, um, but um, I think one concern um, animal care and control would have is that the fence would probably be a better option um, because if the dogs escaped from Mrs. Lohman and went out the door and then went to attack the cats, I mean, that, that's going to be a problem. That, that's all I have to add. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. You, and any other questions for either Do Officer Simpson or, or uh, Mr. Dillon? I have a question just based on what Officer Simpson just asked. Um, Mr. Dillon, is your yard not fenced at all? Um, it's half of it is fenced, but the other half isn't. So like front and back or like- Yeah, side? I'm confused. Or can you try so, to I'm paint sorry. a picture for us? The side, the side of the yard is fenced but just side of it and the side and the end of it is fence. I'm sorry, I don't mean to appear dense, but I'm still a little confused. So does that mean that the kennel area is completely enclosed by a fence or not? The, no, the kennel is in the middle of my yard but it has the floor and the roof, the floor and the roof is chain link and the sides. Okay, all right, gotcha, thank you. So the fence is only about four feet tall then, a standard chain link fence? Um, yes. And but also, not, I'm sorry, kennel, go ahead. The kennel is six foot high, 10 foot wide and 20 foot long. Okay, and so, if in fact, I mean, like I said, we're going to discuss this once, you know, we're, once we deliberate, we'll have some discussion about this. But um, if a fence were to be recommended, um, it, it, the house is rented, correct? You've been renting this house for 20 years, I heard in, in Officer Simpson's testimony. Um, yeah. Is there any, you know, have you ever, have you reached out to the landlord about potential of constructing a fence or anything like that? I mean, that's something that you're not going to be able to make that decision on anyway, I imagine. Right. Um, 
he he the landlord doesn't necessarily want the stockade fence just because of the look of it okay does anyone have any questions for either party for officer simpson or mr dillon I just have a comment. Um, I just want to kind of explain to everyone. I mean, these two dogs um, killed another animal and they're here on vicious orders, which means that, you know, what we're trying to decide today is whether these dogs get put down or not. And, um, you know, because killing another animal is, um, is grounds for vicious orders. And, you know, dangerous orders is um, a level down. And so we're, we're a little bit jumping to, because, you know, our goal is to, is to help these animals. And we need the humans on this, on the side here to try to, um, you know, make that happen. And that's a lot of responsibility. So I think in our minds, we want to save animals, um, whether they're, you know, in a, a brutal accident, we want to save animals and we want to save these two dogs if we can. So in our minds, I feel like we're jumping right to how can we save these animals? But I want to remind everyone that this is a vicious order because there was um, a death of an animal and that um, the case here in front of us is deciding whether these animals get put down or not. And then secondarily, like I said, we're, we're sort of jumping to um, can we save these animals and what are all of the myriad of list of things. I think there's a 13 item list of your home inspection that will be a whole nother topic of whether these dogs could come home to a secure place where they never have a chance to do this again. And that is a big responsibility, Mr. Dillon. So um, I just really wanted to put that out there that, um, you know, the owner isn't here to talk about um, how scary it is to see their animal being attacked and that their cat is passed away from this. And animal killing, while this wasn't animal on human, which would probably change our minds drastically, um, it still is potentially dangerous and, and, um, and grounds for uh, potentially dangerous to humans, but definitely grounds for um, a vicious order for um, killing another animal. So I just kind of wanted to clarify what we're here today talking about in a serious level of this. And it's, um, I mean, we're going to need a lot of, of um, compliance to, for these dogs to to make this kind of decision. So, so that's where we are and that's probably our next step in conversation, but I really wanted to put that out there um, while the panel is still open. Thanks, Stephanie. So I'm gonna give everybody one last chance here, Mr. Dillon, anything else you'd like to say before we close for deliberations? No, sir. Okay, anybody on the panel have any questions before we close? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close for, for open deliberations here. So, um, Mr. Dillon, if we have any questions, if you can answer those questions. Otherwise, we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna discuss this case. So, uh, I'm gonna just go ahead, to, uh, we'll start with Ed. Uh, do you have any comments on, on the case, Ed? Uh, yeah, Tom. Um, one major thing that disturbs me about the, uh, about the case, well, there's, a lot. These type of cases are never a joyous occasion. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you're contemplating um, euthanasia for not only one dog here, but two. Um, and it's, it, it's not to be taken lightly. And it, it, uh, you know, it just chills you to the bone uh, when this is in your lap. But the main thing that that just jumped out at me. Uh, on this case was it seemed like up until this point it was a regular routine thing for these dogs to be let loose and wander about the neighborhood or whatever uh, I think the comment in the interview was something to the effect that uh, it, it knew something was amiss when they didn't return back when they were called or something to that effect and it, it just struck me that this is a regular routine thing uh, that we just open the door, let the dogs out, and they'll come back for dinner or what have you. Um, we can't have that. Um, and it resulted in the death of someone else's pet on their property. Uh, when these dogs were uh, loose, uh, and, and we have a leash law, doesn't meet the 
definition of vicious, and uh, yes, it does, unfortunately. Um, so I, I'm kind of torn. I really am. Uh, it gets you right in the heart, uh, these type of cases. And um, part of me says the order should not be disturbed. Uh, and then the other part of me says, you know, if the owner can comply, which seems like a, a very unlikely thing to happen, um, you know, the dog's lives can be spared. Uh, everybody here would like to spare animals lives. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of our thing. And it really pains me to um, to be on the panel making a decision in this case. However, um, you know, I I don't know uh, if you know. I I always this isn't the first rodeo for for this type of case for me. I always in the back of my mind say to myself. I mean, I remember one case we had. You you guys might too where uh, a lady uh, said in the middle of it, just go ahead and kill him because uh, I'm not building no fence. Um, I always think that maybe the dogs can be saved if someone else could uh, comply and, and love these dogs and take them in and comply with, with the orders. But we don't have that here. We have an owner uh, that has to comply. And um, that's where I am right now. I'm, uh, most of me says the order should not be disturbed because it meets the law. And the law was written for a purpose. And the purpose was to protect an owner with a cat on their, on their own property uh, to be safe. And that's kind of where I am. I'm about 75, 25 on that. Um, and it just, it just pains me. It really does. These types of cases pains me. Uh, I've said that before. I'm going to shut up now. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, All right, thank, thanks, Ed. Yeah, I just, I just really, really want to see the dog spared. But it does meet the definition of the law. Understand. Gotcha. Uh, was Officer McAndrew, do you have any comment? Uh, I, I echo Mr. Evans's as well. I'm on a first blush. I'm leaning towards see if there can be compliance on that family's part on Dykesville Road to maintain these animals. I'm not sure that's going to be possible based on his testimony. So I'm, I'm open to that idea for the dangerous order um, and inspection on his property, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I drive through there all the time. It's a different, it's, it's a rural kind of area. Um, beautiful properties back there. So unfortunately those dogs probably have been running around as provided in the written testimony by the victim. And I'm sure that's the case based on that environment back in Dykes Mill Road. Um, so, you know, Mr. Uh, Dillon testified that he had other animals and those animals have not been attacked by those dogs. I mean, that's just primarily his testimony. So it sounds as though those dogs have killed other cats based on the victim's testimony. And those dogs are running around uh, throughout that neighborhood. So I, I don't want personally to vote to kill those dogs. I'd like to see if the Dillon family can come in compliance with a dangerous order restrictions. All right. Thank you, officer. Um, Enza, do you have any comments? I think I maybe have a more un, a more unpopular um, view. Well, I certainly um, I would echo a lot of Mr. Evans' comments. Um, there's in reading uh, I'm I'm rereading the the witness statements because I find it just as an attorney a little difficult not being able to hear from the victim um, because my understanding is there's been no other reports for these dogs and um, we only have some anecdotal evidence um, in a written statement from someone who's not here that there's been any other incidences and maybe because I'm new to the commission um, I, I'm I guess maybe not as quick to say that 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 is a fact um, just because it was um, written in an after statement um, 
identify one of the victims. I, um, Mr. Dillon testified that he was unaware that the animals had hurt any, that there had been any other incidences and none of his own animals had been um, hurt. So I guess I'm just not as quick to assume that this wasn't a first time um, and maybe hopefully only time mistake um, because I tend to want to lean on the side of the animals and not necessarily any of the people. So I think just for me personally, I would be inclined to give um, Mr. Dillon an opportunity to make the, um, to put in place the necessary requirements to keep the animals safe. He is a 20 year tenant of property that tells me he is um, a responsible property owner. And since from my opinion, I don't see any concrete evidence of other issues. Um, I think he ought to be afforded the opportunity to at least make the attempt. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shryock, uh, Shry I'm sorry. Hi there. Um, I agree with a lot of what Ed said. What really stuck out to me in the interview was when the owner stated that when they return home like they normally do, that really stuck out that that's a common occurrence. They get out of the house. So when he gets out of the house, they don't, he doesn't really know what they do outside of the house. So I would be much like Ed leaning more towards not reducing the order, but I also want to save these young dogs lives. So I'm kind of on the fence right now. I could go either way. Stephanie. Um, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think I sort of um, led off with a little bit of of my thoughts, um, just to clarify and kind of set the tone about that. I do feel it's serious, and and um, and I, you know, to um, Jennifer's point as well. We don't have the victim here. We have a written statement, so I, I definitely um, we don't we strongly suspect this is what happened, but we don't have someone here. Um, to give us um, strong evidence. And, and um, we do believe that this occurred. It does sound like the dogs, um, one, break the law regularly of running at large, um, which is something that their neighbors can call them out on. Um, but that's something that um, there's a leash law and running at large is against the law. So there's multiple laws broken here. Um, and I hope that Mr. Dillon gets the um, severity of that, that you, in a rural area, you can you feel like it's you know all yours and you're out there sort of alone and you have all this open space and you can just let your dogs open the door let them go potty and they come back um and that's just that's just not the case it, um especially now that there's um been a strong evidence that there is been an incident so um but also to um most of the panels point here it does seem like a first incident um maybe there was others but it's not documented so i can't we can't really speak to that um a five-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old dog. Um, I would like to give Mr. Dillon the opportunity to be the responsible pet owner that he should be or could be. Um, he's a responsible tenant, it seems like, um, like to Jennifer's point, 20 years of rental property. So um, could he comply? I'd like to recommend that we as a group try to, um, this wasn't it, I think I, I would feel, let me just say, I, I think I would feel differently if this was a severe bite and attack on humans, but even when a human approached, um, they didn't turn on the human, which sometimes they can have misdirected aggression and just in the heat of the moment, they'll turn on anyone that's there. Maybe they growled to defend whatever, but they never went at a human being. Um, that's a different, whole different level in my mind. Um, I don't think these orders really differentiate that, but I would say that, um, some of them have a high prey drive and that's, um, they can live out their life very happily um, with a very responsible owner that makes sure that they never get out again to terrorize the neighborhood or kill another animal. So um, I'd like to give Mr. Dillon that opportunity. Um, however, I'd say that, um, you know, we don't have the documentation in front of us of downgrading from a vicious order to a dangerous order. Um, I definitely think a dangerous order is uh, appropriate. Um, but if we had that kind of documentation that we were making decisions on today, I would, if possible, if we add in there, I don't know if it's like standard um, that they have to be um, neutered, but I don't think that Odin should go back um, without being neutered. Um, that prey drive and roaming drive is strong. Um, well, Stephanie, if you don't mind, 
So I, I'm going to jump in real quick. I kind of, I'm with everybody on this. I, I think that there's a somewhat lack of doc documentation or not lack of documentation, but there's definitely, I would have liked to have seen, um, you know, the victim's owner, you know, show up and, and speak to this. I think it's, it's a serious case that if the animal, um, you know, was killed, you'd think that it would bring them, you know, regardless of what situation you'd, you'd want to show up and, and say your piece. So I can see that. Um, and I agree with everything that everybody said, but let's, let's go down that path of, you know, if we're going to consider even, you know, if any of us are going to consider dropping this to a dangerous order, uh, to your point, I do believe that having the dog neutered would be on that order. Um, but let's talk about the fence requirement first. I agree with officer Simpson that in this case, a fence would be much more preferable to a kennel. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of this. Um, you know, I don't have a dangerous order in front of me right now, but we know that there's the, you know, there's the key and lock room. There's, there's a couple things in there, you know, that I think could definitely help the situation. Um, would anyone else be in agreement that, you know, if, if we were to drop this down, you know, we could make it so that they must do a fence instead of a kennel. I'm sure we could, you know, we have the, the wherewithal to pretty much make that order say whatever we think is appropriate. So and to your point, mandatory, not fence or kennel, we can make it say that. And if we think that that's going to be the, 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 the deal, I, I, I'd be willing to look, look at that more than leaving the option there. Um, like I said, I, I totally agree that, you know, you look at what, what all these other people have said, or the, the neighbors said this animal has been loose multiple times and we've, we've got some, some witness statements, but you know, there was no priors. No one's ever bothered to call animal control before about this. Um, you know, hasn't been something that other neighbors in the area have called and complained about. Um, but you know, and the other thing I was thinking, which is, you know, as you mentioned the pack mentality, I mean, is there anything to, you know, dropping the order to dangerous order on one of the dogs and leaving the business in place for the other? I know I'm, I hate the muddy the waters like this, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a thought that I had. So I don't know if anyone else has any comment on that. My comment to that is that without the victim here to describe what they saw of did one, was an, one animal, the, the in, uh, instinctive, um, uh, basically the one inciting the incident and the other one joined in was one doing more than the other. I, we don't have any of that kind of information at our hands to um, just that they were both biting. So they're both in my mind, I, I know what you're saying. Cause sometimes in cases we've seen that where sometimes there's one dog that was really primary in the situation. And I don't think we can differentiate that at this point. Um, you know, yeah, I mostly agree with that statement. I, I don't, you know, I, I just figured I'd put it out there to see my yeah. thoughts, but I would agree with that. And then one final comment I wanted to, to make as well to your point about making the fence um, mandatory um, because, you know, just memory of what's in these um, dangerous orders is that it sounds very unlikely it, a, a lifetime of opening the door and letting them and letting them out to go potty is more conducive to a fenced in area versus with a dangerous order in place, they need to leash up and muzzle these dogs and hand walk them to this kennel to release them into the kennel. They can't just, you know, walk them free toward the kennel. They have to be, you know, double leash carabiners and a, and a muzzle on and escorted to their kennel to be released for exercise. So, that's, you know, I think that that's less likely to be a compliant situation when they've had a lifetime of being open the door and let out. And to your point, I think that's why you said offense, I think, is going to be the the key way to offer success. And that's why we should make, you know, that's in our mind of how to how to help them be successful, um, how to help the owner help these animals. Um, and that's our thoughts there so about the fence. I, so I, I think that's why you're going that way, because of the the escorting them to the kennel just seems really unlikely and it seems like a, a, a recipe for disaster there. I agree. Does, that, does anyone else have any comment on that aspect of this? Well, Tom, uh, Mr. Dillon uh, did state that he wanted his dogs back. Um, I firmly believe that, uh, you know, it, it uh, incidents like these are the owner's fault. It's not the animal's fault. They only do what they're allowed to do. So uh, I don't know whether I'm making a motion here or not, but uh, it sounds like it, what's getting ready to come out of my mouth. I would give him uh, a reasonable amount of time to comply with the uh, uh, items of a uh, dangerous order. 
uh, say 90 days, uh, whatever you guys think is reasonable, to come in compliance with the uh, stipulations of a dangerous order. Uh, bottom line, it, you know, once the time is up, the vicious order would stand. Um, to, you know, to get them to get them motivated and going. If he really said he wants his dog back and he will do anything to 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 do that, then let's get that fence up. Let's let's do our job to protect the community. Uh, get the fence up. You know, whatever else, the muzzles. If you're going to walk them outside the fence, what whatever the stipulations would say in a normal dangerous order, uh, comply with monitored uh, by Anne Arundel County uh, Animal Control, Animal Care and Control. Um, and once uh, the, the thumbs up is given on the compliance, then he gets his dog back within that amount of time. Is that a motion? <laughs> I think so. It's a long-winded one, but... Uh, I'll, do, so I'll do officially, I'll say, uh, I move to uh, downgrade the... Uh, vicious order for Lucy and the vicious order for Odin to down to a dangerous order. I had one question. Oh, sorry. The dangerous order, does there re is there a requirement for insurance? Um, yeah. There, yeah. So, so let's go over that. Let's go over that before we, let, before we move on any motions, let's mm -hmm. do that. I want to be real specific with the motion. Also, I want to be, I, I would, I want to be specific about the fence, you know, as a, as a specific in the, in the motion, if we're going to do this. Um, and I'd like to be specific about what is in an order because we do have some new people here that are not familiar with the orders. I do not have one up in front of me. I don't, let me see if. It's not in the packet for this case. Yeah. I think so, I mean, basically, well, right. So some of the main sticking points is we're going to have the insurance requirement for insurance, uh, a certain amount of uh, level of insurance. I can't remember what it is, like a million dollars policy or something like that. Um, um, it's 300,000 according to the code. Is it it 300,000? Yep. Yeah, I knew it was a high number. Um, we have the um, the neutering we want to include in there. We're going to have a, a, the animal should be in a key and lock room uh, when anyone under the age of 18 is in the house. The animal must be walked on a six foot leash, um, not a retractable type leash, but a six foot leash, nylon mm -hmm. leash uh, with a muzzle. Um, in our case, we, we're, you know, if, if the motion is, is approved, we would be approving, you know, only if a fence was in order. Um, sure. Yes. Can I just ask Probably. where you're, uh, for my own information, some of the, I, I'm, because I'm following like line by line in the code because I'm new at this and I, I just don't know, but some of the things that you just mentioned, like um, not being around children under the age of 18, the six foot leash, things like that are not in the code. So where are you getting that from? They are actually in the dangerous order that the, that animal control provides. So they're in the order itself. So technically we can make, we can require training in the order. We can require anything we desire. I mean, literally we could go as far as to say, you know, we got to make sure the dog eats lollipops, right? I mean, we could say whatever we want, but you know, obviously it has to be approved by the, by the commissioner or by the, okay. um, but there is a catch all at the end, such other conditions. I just didn't, I'm, like I said, I was just looking for, where that authority came from. But so under that last provision, such other conditions as the agency determines is in the public interest, that's where you just kind of group whatever else for a particular situation you think is. Right. There, okay. um, there's 13 points. And, and normally to, to your point, Jennifer, this is a little bit out of character for a case. Um, the fact that this is a vicious order and, and all that we're dis discussing is whether we're gonna, we don't have normally in our packets, we have, um, a potentially dangerous or dangerous order in our packet if that's what we're working with but because this was a vicious order that um, item that lists out 13 different things that they must comply is not in this packet because it um you know we weren't exist. we weren't specifically this isn't a dangerous order we're, we're down regulating it to that if if we vote on that um, that's what we'd like to do but that's why it's not in front of us so i and it's making it more confusing for you and i apologize for that that's okay i, I mean I'll, I'll figure it out i just <laughs> yeah so that's you. not in there yeah you're getting baptized by fire here robin did you have something you wanted to add i, I see that oh. you have something I, I wanted to pop on because it is, we do have a couple of new um, members today. So generally speaking, in answer to your question, Jennifer, the way the code is written is it's written very generally, not specifically, but things like, for example, number one is manage the animal and its environment in a manner that will abate the problem. 
So that's one of the ones where a lot of the specific stipulations that are in a dangerous order may come from that, from abating the problem. So for example, in this case that they're discussing, these animals got loose, they escaped from someone at a door, right? So we have things that are often in order set for animals that have escaped from a door that deal with secondary barriers to prevent escape at a door and fencing to prevent animals from getting off a of property. So the, the law is written very generally. And while not every order is the same, there are many common things that, that happen in a lot of the orders. Um, because a lot of times there are similarities. Most of the cases that we deal with are animals getting off the property, roaming at large, and it's how did they do that. So when we have something in the law that's uh, manage the animal and the environment, it gives way to all of these specific things that are then discussed as to how we manage the animal and how we abate that situation. Is that helpful? Is that more like what you're looking for? Okay. Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand. That's uh, fine. Um, so, so moving forward, those, you know, those are the big items that I, that I can think of, you know, the, the, the six foot stockade fence or, you know, privacy fence sometimes is re required or, uh, referred to, um, I would say that that, you know, that's something that needs to be in this order. Um, but those are the big ones, the leash, the muzzle, um, the heat and locked room, uh, secondary barriers. So the dog can't escape. When you open the door, you have another gate to hold that dog back. Um, you know, all those things are, are are going to be in the dangerous order. So we would, you know, that's what we would be recommending if that's what if that's what we move. So I think if everyone is on board with that, I'll I'll, I'll take a motion as soon as anyone's ready. I, I did have a question for Robin. How long will you house the animals for him to come in compliance, Robin? So um, this case is a little bit different than usual because usually what happens is we issue the order and then they have ten days to appeal. Um, normally what happens is, so they've already done that, right? The owner's already appealed this order. Um, so we're already past that, but then they have another 30 days to appeal the recommendation that you all make. So what we would typically do is they would have that 30 days um, to appeal. And then if they haven't appealed the recommendation that you all has may, have made, at the end of that 30 days, we would issue them a letter that says that they have 10 days to comply um, with the order, assuming that's what the chief of police recommends supporting you all's recommendation, um, or the animals would be, we would make final disposition on the animals. And I should say while I'm back on here, do you all want us to send you a copy of like the most stringent dangerous order that we do so you all can review that before you make your recommendations? Because I hear a lot of, I don't have an order in front of me. We, yeah, have, I mean, we have kind of a template of our most severe, and then you could choose what you give and take just so that we're it, it's a little bit easier and you're not trying to kind of go from scratch scratch would that be helpful because i'm sure I'll yeah I mean, you think you do, you do can, that do you think you could add it to the drive is that something that i can access quickly the google drive share yeah. Um, yeah i have a question though <clears throat> based on the timelines you just gave um that would if he was going to do this give him about 40 days to do this fence however that would require him to use some of his 30-day appeal time and I have just a legal issue with penalizing somebody for using that time to consider whether or not to appeal before making a decision to act. So if you just, if he has his 30 days to appeal and, and on the 30th day, he makes that decision, no, you know what, I really want my dogs, I'm going to do this. That only leaves him with 10 days to come into compliance with the stuff and everything I'm hearing takes a lot longer than 10 days. Um, so my question is, are you limited by that or can you extend that? I don't want I to think, penalize somebody for properly using their 30 day appeal period. So in my no, mind, no, I think we the can, 10 days we can is actually, added. we can add that time on. If we decide as the commission right. part right. of that stipulation, we can add like, like Ed had mentioned 90 days, we give them, okay. you know, 69 days on top of whatever we can say from, from after appeal, however we need yeah, to word it, we can say after appeal, you have 60, 90 days, whatever we decide, we can add that into the order specifically. We can- The end of the appeal period. Okay, that, all right, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I would just recommend you not change the appeal period, but change the compliance period. And it should all, all be in Actually, the drive can't. for you all we now. We don't have the authority to change the appeal period. That's statutory. Right. The appeal period is what it is. Now, back to Officer McAndrew's question. If we were to do that, you have the capability to house those animals for- We have to, whether we like it or not, we have to. The I tough thing so. for okay. the animals is that means that the animals are- 
Okay. You know, gotcha. stuck, stuck here um, in, in Iran where they can't um, have the opportunity to go outside and interact for safety reasons. Um, here, they would be in their back to back run, gotcha. um, waiting for the owner to comply. So we always encourage owners to comply as quickly as possible. And right. are, they the incurring, are they incurring the fee of $5 a day for the duration that the dogs are there? Each yes, dog? they are. Right. Good. Okay. Thank you, Robin. You're welcome. All right. Did that does that satisfy everybody? Officer McAndrew, does that answer no. your question? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I was just curious, you know, what her capacity was. For I understand. Yeah. There was a mention of 90 days. That seems awful long. That, well, that's fine. I, I I kind of agree with that. Um, so to that point, does anybody want to make a motion uh, based or what, do you want to wait a minute and see if we get this added to the drive? Yeah, I'm so, looking um, through the drive right now. Yeah, if you go it's back down drive. to just the main folder, it's a uh, dangerous order edit PDF. It's just a, a template that is used. It's pretty generic, so uh, not gospel, but a good guideline. You may have to refresh your, your drive if you're in that folder already. Just hit the refresh button. Okay, Tom, I'm just looking over things and it looks like the microchip and the neutering is included in there. Um, yep. that, that doesn't need to be um, specified, you know, uh, additionally. And it looks like what we're all talking about is how, how comfortable we feel with number three about um, the fencing versus this kennel that has been, um, you know, I mean, to his credit, he has made this, this kennel that's, you know, quite large and um, got a roof cap on it so they can't scale it and get out of there. So that, that's a great thing. But I think, you know, for the rest of their lives in a one and a half year old dog, open the door and go potty in a backyard, it seems, um, you know, setting them up for success is what we're talking about here. And and number three we um, is where we're talking about a six foot um, stockade fence that we want to talk about requiring a fence versus, because it says either or, either this fence or this kennel. He's, you know, complied by making the kennel, but the question is, do we feel comfortable um, making that recommendation? And and um, I think that's what we're where we are right now, talking about um, making a motion to um, to move to this dangerous order, um, modifying number three to um, require a fence versus a kennel. Gotcha. And before Is we that do a summary of where we are, kind of. I think so. Yes. And I, and I think before we actually have someone make the motion, I think Mc, the officer McAndrew had uh, some concern with 90 days. I, I, let's have a discussion on on the, the time frame and what we all think is, you know, and when, when, when I'm speaking about to the time frame, I'm, I'm talking about after, you know, after they had the chance to appeal. So not the, the 30 day appeal time or whatever. This will be all we're going to allow after that. I kind of agree 90 days may be too long. I was thinking maybe 60 days. 30 to 60 days, 45 days in that range, something like that. I mean, it shouldn't take, you know, I put fence up in my backyard in, in 24 hours. So, you know, in about an acre. So I think that, uh, you know, a fenced in area in the backyard shouldn't take time personally, but I don't know what you guys have any thoughts on that. And they don't have to fence in their entire property. They can fence in an um, right. area that, you know, not the whole thing, but an area that the dogs can be in. So it doesn't have to be this encompassing of the entire property. Um, I think that's and, what he was in. And it, yeah. the fenced area would right. be subject to review by animal control. They would have to approve the fencing once it's been installed. It can't. It's not just that they can slap up whatever and it's good to go. It needs to be approved by animal control first. 
And I understand that Mr. Dillon is still on a listen only at this point. So for his benefit, that's something that we're talking about is that the fence doesn't have to encompass when speaking to the landlord of this property that you're a tenant of for 20 years. Um, you know, the, the fencing, you know, the look of it or what have you, it's not the entire property. It's something that um, you guys can decide on. And like you said, um, Tom, it can be a, approved before you even, you know, break ground on this project or what have you. But um, but it doesn't have to be in the entire property encompassing, but, need, you know, an area that you let the dogs into. Um, so that makes it budget friendly and also, um, you know, for the, the property owner maybe to be... Um, more apt to, to get this kind of project rolling, so. That was part of my concern. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the budget friendly um, because while I understand a fence can be constructed quickly, um, there is also a cost component to this and we are talking about a tenant um, and not a homeowner. So I wanted to make sure that um, if that was the direction the commission was gonna go in, they gave um, Mr. Dillon ample time to be able to get his finances in order because there's several things at play here besides fines and, and um, neutering and um, you know, the, what's accumulating daily. And the, I understand in reading the code that the license is now $250 a year per dog um, for this. So I just wanted to make sure that what we were doing is attainable and we weren't setting Mr. Dillon necessarily up to fail before he got started. Well, I think the big question, all this is going to be, you know, obviously he doesn't own the property, so he'd have to have approval for the fence through his Agreed. also. So that's right. something that, you know, I, I'm. To your point though, it, through this process, um, we can make this recommendation and he has time to appeal it if he's something that and modify and come back to us um, to talk about it. If we make this recommendation, again, it's just a recommendation of what we think. And then he has time to appeal the dangerous order and ask for modifications. And um, if, if that's what, if he runs into some blockades there. So I think that would be something that, um, that he could come back to us about. Um, finances and once he's looked into it a bit further that, that would be like the next appeal process if he wanted any any further modifications but uh, it, it is a lot to your point um you know this is a vicious order and for the owner to get their dogs back and be a responsible dog owner it's costly and it will be for the rest of the life of these dogs that they will be subject to inspections um, for public safety and it is a huge responsibility and it's it lies solely on the owner of being a responsible pet owner. Um, and it, like Ed said, it's, you know, not the animal's fault. Oftentimes it's, a, it's the humans that fail them. And so um, what we can do is outline the, the protocol of what would be the responsible things to comply with. And if he's capable of that, he'll get his dogs back. And if not, then he's maybe not a candidate for being a pet owner. It doesn't mean that these animals will be destroyed because we're downgrading from a deficient order to a dangerous order, but they may not go back to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, but I didn't dogs. understand. I'm glad you pointed yeah. that out. Uh, okay, I, I didn't register the difference. They, that's actually very important yeah. to me because I didn't want the, the dog's existence to balance on whether or not this gentleman could afford a fence because that to me seemed patently unfair to the animal right um, and so we're, we're changing this down to a dangerous order and, okay and and so that takes the vicious order off the table for us and if he comes back to us with more questions we're working within the boundaries of a dangerous order um, for the dogs to come home but it doesn't put them back in a vicious order category we're trying to okay. yeah okay that helps okay good yes that helps me tremendously <laughs> good 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 yeah, and if I, if I understand it correctly, Jennifer, he can uh, make a notification of an animal care and control that he can't comply. And then from there, there's a decision on what to do with the animals. And if and that's correct, isn't it, Robin? Correct. Yeah. I think that's right. But just just to be clear, animal care and control cannot legally place animals deemed dangerous. Um, the owner could say, I'm going to give them to my cousin. And my cousin's going to comply um, if they have a house in this county, right? Yeah. Or right. I'm going to give them to a friend that lives in another county, and then animal care and control would have to contact that county, advise them of the order here, which would, if that's what you all recommend, be a dangerous order with all the stipulations that you recommend, and then that would be up to that county to determine whether or not they would honor our order or have their own order, and it would depend on their laws for an animal coming in from outside of the county for how that would proceed. 
So uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, so back to let's get back to the, the, to the time frame here. I mean, with that in mind and the appeals process in mind, I mean, what do you guys, what do you all think would be a fair time frame? 45. 45? I'm leaning towards 45 as well. And that's after the 30 day appeal, right? I, I agree. Yes. Okay. I agree. 45. I was going to say 60, but 45. I can live with 45. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so I, does anyone want to make a motion? And it's going to be a very specific motion. And actually, also, I would consider as part of the motion, I would I would consider, um, and you guys may, you know, that this maybe we, we want to spell out that if they, you know, we were discussing that if um, if they do not comply after the 45 days, that it will revert back to the vicious order. That's what someone had mentioned earlier. Is that something we want to discuss or we do? Yeah, not that's what I was wondering if that's if that actually happens or, or how does that how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I guess we just discussed kind of what could happen is that they, that they could find another owner. I mean, like if, if he just vanishes, let's say, let's just say there's no more contact. He doesn't like what we've said. He loses an appeal, you know, and then he just walks away from the whole thing. Then the animal does, then does the vicious order kick back in or um, do, the, do they have the option? Because like you said, the animal control can't get him out. No, Robin, if I'm, if I'm correct, Robin, once we modify the order, the order stands as a dangerous order. It doesn't go back up to vicious. Do we have the authority to add that to the bottom and, and have a uh, chief of police, uh, once he looks it over, uh, if he puts a seal of approval on it, uh, is that legal? That, that may be our current question who I hope is on at this point, not me. Um, I do want to point out though, I know Jennifer had mentioned $250 license fee. It's actually, uh, as of 2017, it's a $125 dangerous order license fee. So I think Phil has sent you an updated code because I'm not sure which one you're maybe working with. Um, sometimes the code on the website takes a while to get updated, but it, it does have the 125 dangerous license fee now. Um, and Curran, I'm hoping you can pop on to answer that. Usually what Curran tells me is the commission can recommend whatever they want, and then it's up to the chief of police whether or not they, uh, well, I mean, they or she in this case would, would honor that. I mean, yes. I think based on our discussion, we were kind of hoping that, you know, they, that someone would take this order on. And if the, if the order sticks with the dog, then whoever were to take the order on, you know, would, would then be able to, you know, follow up with the order in our county anyway, and these dogs' lives would be saved, and hopefully they would live their lives out without any more incident. And that's what our goal is here. But if everyone just kind of says, forget the whole thing, I'm, I'm assuming it just reverts back to the vicious order. I, I want to, you know, I think Kern, if you can speak to that, that would be. So it, you can make the recommendation and it would be up to the chief of police whether or not to uh, keep a provision that has it reverting from dangerous to vicious if there's no compliance. I'm not sure how much that really changes because if there's no compliance and if he's not, you know, having someone else comply and take ownership of the dogs kind of on his behalf, animal control, animal care and control makes a disposition of the animals, which would, as Robin has said, basically is in line with what a vicious order would be at that point in the game. That's All right, if so it gets that far. So I'm not sure how much it would really change if, if you're saying that, the dangerous order he can comply with or someone else can comply with and if he doesn't then it goes to vicious i guess it basically I, it deals with itself i see what you're saying right it, okay i understand all right so we don't need to be specific yeah. we don't need to be specific in our in our motion then no okay. okay all right so if anyone has a motion or any other questions from Karen, I, I think we're good to go if anyone wants to make a motion I'll, i'm ready to hear it um, Robin, just to clarify, the 250, I pulled that from number five of the dangerous order, <laughs> not from the statute. In the dangerous order that was just sent, number five says that a new license at a yearly cost of $250. So that's where I got that. So that must be an old template, I'm guessing, that they sent in. I haven't seen the template. I'm not in the drive. Um, they were okay. uploading that when I was talking to you guys. So that template, they, they're probably just in the habit of updating it now for us. So thank you for answering that, Jennifer. I'll, I'll make the motion, uh, Tom, that uh, uh, the vicious order would be reduced to the uh, dangerous, where the uh, owner will have 45 days from the end of the uh, appeal period uh, to comply with uh, all the items within. Um, I guess that would be enough said, right? Yeah, 
Uh, if you want to be specific about number three. Um, the must have the fence, a six foot fence, uh, the muzzles, um, the neutering, um, all of the items that uh, we went through. It would have to be uh, complied with all of them. Um, no kennels, the, the fence. And again, I don't know whether we want to go into the uh, specifics of the fence does not have to encompass the entire property, uh, but enough uh, to where the dogs can be comfortable and get exercise, uh, as uh, Stephanie has stated. Um, and once animal care and control, uh, you know, can uh, put their seal of approval on the compliance, then the dogs uh, shall be returned. Okay. And, and just to clarify for you, on number three, it says that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not looking at it. I don't. I'm sorry. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I thought there was a measurement there. My bad. There's not a measurement there. To your point, though, uh, three would be we are requiring a fence that would be approved through animal control and no um, no kennel. That's good. Right. I heard all those in his motion. I heard everything he said in his motion seemed, you know, I think we hit everything. Does everyone. Yeah, if, if I have a second on that. Um, that one second, Tom. Does okay. I, I don't have the the items uh, in front of me, and I one of the dogs I believe is uh, one or two years old. Yes. Um, does the items have anti digging, an anti digging measure for the fence so they can't dig under it and get out? Uh, I don't believe that they do, but we can definitely add that if you all think that that's something we should add. I, I definitely think that's something that we should have in there because uh, of the younger dog and dig a hole. Uh, not that the older dog couldn't too, but uh, the the younger uh, probably would. Phil? What's an anti-digging uh, anti device must cover the entire floor of the pen and be constructed of concrete foundation or a minimum uh, number nine or 11.5 gauge heavy duty. If the fencing is used, it must be covered with appropriate flooring, i.e. dirt, sawdust, mulch to prevent injury. So yeah, that's, that's for that's a kennel. Enough. But that's for a kennel, yes. That's, that's kennel. not for the fence. Well, we don't know that this dog is going to try to escape from the fence. We have not yeah. even. No, and I would think it. that animal control during a, a routine inspection could catch the issue there. I believe it. And right. Maybe. We'll leave that to the to their inspections. Okay. If that's okay. <laughs> All right. So does anyone? I mean, let's. You want to start fresh again with another? motion or we get or there's one on the table i don't i'm, I'm kind of i'm ready, ready to vote <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to take a second on, on uh, i'll second ed's mo ed's initial motion 45 okay. days so, so we have required. a motion yes 45 days so the motion on the table is that uh that he will have 45 days beyond the the uh 30 day period to comply with a fence mandatory fence no kennel allowed and all Who the other and there was there was the other one of neutering Odin. yeah all the i was going to say all the other okay. requirements in the dangerous order that that we've read here all 13 They're standard standard items they're already yes. listed yep right the, the only amount of case we're making is number three so we have a second so all in favor okay looks like we got unanimous all right so phil i guess with these i'm gonna i can come in later this week and sign these is that okay Yes, sir. That'd be great. And then um, the minutes from last time and the minutes from this time, I'll have a physical copy. Uh, if you're still acting chairman, you know, I can uh, send them to you or have you come and grab them or bring them by. And then if we uh, vote on someone else, we can just have them sign off on all of them moving forward and okay. then vote on them at the hearing where they're officially chairman. Okay. And then can I ask Robin a question? Robin, sure. jump on. Robin, in this case, uh, is there a communication with uh, the owner of the animal that the decision's been made for that so, owner to start to prepare for this process? Or do you guys wait till you mail him the order? So what we'll have to do is we take, um, I work on throughout this process, writing up recommendations to the chief. Those go up the chain of command so the chief can review the decision. Mm -hmm. And then once she decides whether or not she's going to uphold or modify that recommendation, then we communicate that to the owner um, with a copy of the order. 
because we're outside the discussion of the order, but to me, he did not seem very prepared today um, with his appeal process. I mean, he had an appeal, but it wasn't, um, he, he wasn't really prepared to even review this dangerous order concept. And I didn't know if there was discussion uh, from your office to him about all these requirements and advances appeal or not. Not that now, he didn't know it, not that we made that, we made the dangerous order, but was there any discussion about all these requirements to be a pet owner in these circumstances? Uh, Roger would, would have to answer what he discussed with him, but typically we do not discuss the what ifs and other possibilities with people, okay. we only discuss what our recommendation is with them. That mm -hmm. being said, you know, there are certainly dangerous orders and other information that are that are out there from, from prior orders and other mm -hmm. cases. Um, but we try not to get people's hopes up one way or another or make people okay. think any decision has been made prior to the recommendations of the commission. Um, but in terms of his time frame, that 30 days from appeal, that won't start today. That will start after the chief's decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The 30 days for appeal. For him to appeal. Forty-five days after, right? And okay. then it would be the forty-five days after that. It's so, approved, so the the time it takes for the chief to come up with her decision um, will not impact his his actual time, time frame right. for doing things. Okay. So, all right. So we have another case. Does anybody need a quick break before we jump into this next case? Uh, Tom, I would just like to add uh, to this and to anybody uh, that may be watching this uh, now or later that our decision um, as a board does not in any way minimize uh, the cat's life. Uh, that, that was very important. Uh, the cat was on its own property and um, we, feel, we feel very, very bad about that. This is in no way doing that, but we are not a commission that does an eye for an eye uh, necessarily. Um, and I just wanted to add that I feel really bad about the death of the cat, really bad. I have four myself, so I wouldn't want to lose any of them. Agreed, thank you for that. That, you know, just that if the owner that had um, an, a medical emergency that can't be here understands that um, where our mindset and where our heart is on that. Appreciate that, Ed. Okay. So thank you, Ed and Stephanie. Um, does any, if we're all good to go, we'll go ahead and call the next case, Phil. Thank you, sir. Our next case is Matthew Bentley versus Benjamin O'Dell and the citation for animal disturbance or Forrest the dog. All parties who have an interest in this case who wish to testify may now come forward to take the oath. I see both parties here. I'm going to bring them up now. I see you there, Mr. Bentley. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, Matthew Joseph Bentley, 1405 Triton Court, Edgewater, Maryland, 21037. Thank you, sir. Hang out for just one second. We'll get you all sworn in at the same time. All right, just trying to get Mr. Odell up here. Mr. Odell, if you can hear me, if you could start your video and audio. There we go. I got the video. Got the audio. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect, sir. If you could please state your name and address for the record. My name is Benjamin Odell. I reside at 1318 Sunday Drive, Edgewater, Maryland. Thank you kindly. Uh, if you would please both raise your right hand. Do you declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you both. You may proceed. Here. Just give me one second. Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm working on another computer trying to bring up all the documentation. Give me one second.
sorry. All right, Mr. Bentley, if you want to go ahead, I just I wanted to make sure I had everything up. I'm working on everything, all the technology right now with all the Zoom stuff. It's a little crazy. I'm working on two computers and a <laughs> phone, phone going at the same time. Uh, I understand. Uh, you know, so my, my affidavit was pretty thorough. I assume everyone's read it. Uh, for me, I hate the fact that I'm even here today, especially after hearing that last case. I mean, this issue seems pretty trivial uh, on the scale of zero to 10. Um, but I I've tried everything I can to resolve this issue. Yeah, you know, it's been going on for two and a half years. It, this isn't personal for me. You know, every time Mr. O'Dell and I have talked, we've had very pleasant conversations. Uh, I, the, the bottom line is I don't even want him to actually have to pay this ticket but I've tried to work this out and, and I feel like I'm getting nowhere and it's taken two and a half years for me to get to this point. You know, if Mr. Odell, and it seems like it's gotten better since I initiated this process, to be quite honest, I can tell because I've only heard the dog bark a few times in the last month uh, where it's woken us up. But, you know, from my, from my, the bottom line, you know, just to save time from my point of view is as long as I don't hear Forrest before 7 a.m. or after 9 p.m. at night, we're good. That's it. It's really that simple. And, and, and I'll drop this whole issue, but it's really, you know, it's going to be up to Mr. Odell how, how he wants to proceed. Yeah. And, and like I said, I assume everybody saw the affidavit I put out. We usually read it in real time with you here. Um, so that's where we are. We're all kind of perusing and, and um, would you go a little bit further while we're also um, looking this over um, and describe what is, um, you gave some time frames of the barking that seems bothersome. Can you describe what's happening with the barking? That, that's the noise ordinance we're here for. Yep, so, so uh, my rear left corner of our property touches Mr. Odell's rear left corner of his property. And when, when uh, Forrest barks, it is a big, loud, booming bark that wakes us up, no matter if it's, you know, 6 a.m. or 10.30 p.m. This And that was mostly before the pandemic when that was the issue. Um, so, so that's really the issue. And I and I just wanted to stop. I, I it, It's really just that simple. I mean, Forrest is a big dog. Forrest is a really nice dog. I met Forrest. It, again, this isn't about the dog. It's just a, a, about the barking. Mr. Bentley? Yes. Um, uh, do you happen to have any recordings of the barking? I, I don't have any recordings of the barking. So, uh, you know, it, I, again, it, but, but what I can tell you, uh, it is a very loud, booming bark. Um, it, it, and our master bedroom is on that rear left corner of our house. So it's like it's, you know, like going off right in the backyard. Okay. Thank you. You bet. And, and also, to be fair to Mr. Odell, he, he's absolutely correct when he says sometimes Forrest will only bark one time. But that one time is loud enough to, to wake us up. And again, this has been going on for two and a half years. Uh, it, it's get, it gets better, then it gets worse. It, it, it's, it, you know, it, it is what it is. All right, does any more, anybody have any more questions for Mr. Bentley? Well, I, I am seeing um, some documentation here. I know Ed asked about a video, um, which does help us understand the character of barking because a single bark um, is one thing, even if it's booming, it can happen, dogs bark. But a lot of times um, we try to characterize the, the disturbance and, um, continued barking, duration of barking. And what I have here is some dates. Like for instance, if you said uh, we have here January 8th, January 10th, 13th, 14th, 15th, the 29th, February 5th, February 10th, um, all of them around 6 a.m. It seems like it's their go out in the morning potty opportunity. Um, and that's, you know, this dog's schedule goes out at 6 a.m. Um, and, and it's, it's, earlier than you'd like to be <laughs> awoken by a bark. And that's what I'm gathering. Um, Correct. And that seems like, so in these times, like you have it 618 in the morning, 610 in the morning, 558 in the morning, um, the barking that occurs at that time, um, sometimes it is a single bark, you you, you admit, but then other times, what, what are like, going on? It's like, you know, three, four barks. Mm-hmm. And what, and, you know, and that's, a, we also try to, this can be kind of arbitrary for us because what can be 
um, sort of unbearable for one person um, it may not be the same level of tolerance for another person. Um, so I would say that um, when it comes to um, disturbances or noise ordinances that, um, you know, I put that out there, you have an idea of what would be acceptable for timeframes for you. Um, but from the, the, um, when we look at citations, there there is no, it's 24 seven. There's no time frame that you're allowed to have your dog bark for an hour at four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon is not okay either. Um, dogs cannot continue to bark and that's how the ordinances are read. Noise ordinances are not, um, a lot of times people think that like, oh, you've, you have to be quiet after 10 p.m. and there's like this cutoff time in, in these um, in these cases, but it, it's 24 seven. Dogs are not allowed to bark um, even if it's two o'clock in the afternoon and, and that, determining what this incessant barking would be or how that that's why we ask about the character when it's happening how long is it happening um you know what what is the surrounding circumstances so we can understand um what is a nuisance um to you and then also um understanding the dog's bark a single bark may not be a nuisance to me um but that's where we're trying to understand um where we how, how we can address this and that's some of the questions that we're trying to get here so that so that documentation is excellent definitely helps us um and to ed's point sometimes a video helps us understand the character of the bark of what's happening does that make sense sure yeah so on some of these i guess to get to my question as i sort of prefaced that is that you know i've got the documentation um a lot of them are around 6 a.m um, sometimes it's a single bark, but sometimes um, it's, you know, how long does the barking continue? Uh, you, you know, it only happens for a few seconds, but again, the issue is that it's, it's so loud that it wakes us up. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, and when, the, when this first started in October of 2018, if you, if you look at the affidavit, um, it, most of it back then was, you know, 1030 at night, 1130 at night, uh, and, and that was the real issue. And then... With the pandemic, the the, the six a.m. issue started. Okay. And, and everybody's get you know everyone's on a lockdown, right? I I have lung damage from my rack, so I've been home for almost thirteen months. Uh, so obviously, you know, we've got two young kids, so our schedules are all out of whack, and, and I get that. It's just, yeah. and, and the frustrating thing is. I hate having to do this as a former Marine. I, I want to work this out. I, I mean, that's just my nature is to be able to work this out, but I, I've reached a point where I obviously can. Yeah. And that's what we hope for too, is that when you live in close quarters, like what you're saying, how your property um, is a 0.3 to a 0.4 acre and it touches the left corner. And when we oh, live yeah. in close proximity to neighbors, the neighborly thing is, is that we have to adjust what would be a normal, what our normal routine is, we've got to learn to live together. Um, and so, uh, you know, to your point, like you said, you try to try to work this out directly. And that's what we always hope for is that neighbors can um, figure out what works for everybody. Um, so that's all the questions I have for at, at this moment. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Anyone else before we hear from Mr. Odell? Okay, Mr. Odell. You'd like to uh, respond? Hi, sir. Good morning. My name is Ben O'Dell, and I am the owner of Forest. And Forest is a 10 going on 11 year old senior German short haired pointer. He's gentle, well mannered, well disciplined, uh, registered with the county, never any discipline problems. Um, and uh, we have had Forest, my wife and I actually met because of the dog. It was my wife's dog's first. We met because of the dog, the rest is history. Uh, we have a one-year-old daughter, lived in the community, moved in about March of 2018. And since then we had received several complaints from Matt about our dog barking. I was very apologetic and you know assured him that we would keep everything under control. And uh, just to give you a little more background about Forrest, uh, we do have a fenced in yard that fully encloses our property. He does wear a shot collar. And uh, we take him out. Uh, being a 11, almost 11 year old senior dog, he is on a strict schedule. Uh, he needs let out between 5.45 and 6.15 in the morning. And that's his schedule. And that's also my wife and I's schedule as I need to leave for work by 6.30 every morning. Uh, I do not have the luxury of working from home aside from today uh, for this hearing. 
but I do need to leave uh, for my job. And so Forrest is let out in the morning, he's let out at night, and he does get a lot of exercise. We take him to the dog park, we walk him for probably 30 minutes to an hour in the morning, 30 minutes to an hour at night. So he's outside, he's getting plenty of interaction with other dogs, he's getting plenty of interaction with other people. Uh, we have a one-year-old daughter who's, who's very gentle around. And um, so to Mr. speak to Mr. Bentley's complaint, um, we do not allow force to become a nuisance. And I have received the, his affidavit of complaint and the complaint stems from Article 12, Section 4904, Animal Disturbance Prohibited. And uh, just for recollection, it states anyone who owns, keeps, or has possession of an animal shall not permit the animal to disturb the quiet of a person or a neighborhood. My wife or I do not permit or allow him to be a nuisance. When we let him out in the morning, I'm typically out there with him. And so Forrest, his barking is very sporadic. When I say barking, it's a woof, maybe one woof, maybe two or three woofs, and then he stops. And we don't him to continue because he's disciplined. When I say no, he listens, he stops. And if he doesn't stop, then we initiate light discipline. And if he doesn't stop from there, we just bring him back inside. So I realized that with our work schedule that um, we, we don't want anyone to hear him, regardless of time of day, whether it's six in the morning, whether it's noon, whether it's 10 o'clock at night, we don't want people to be bothered by him. And in the three years that I've lived here, Mr. Bentley seems to be the only neighbor that's bothered by our dog. And I'm sure you guys get a lot of uh, hearsay, or he said, he said, when it comes to these types of matters, so uh, the statement that I submitted, I also submitted 10 sworn affidavits from 10 neighbors that live, nine neighbors, excuse me, that live closer to Mr. Bentley, that in the three year period that we have lived here have never had issue with our dog. One of the individuals, um, I mentioned the 10th, uh, Mr. Bentley had uh, initiated a police complaint against us. And last year, uh, Anne Arundel County Officer Corporal Rick Brookman was sent to our house to investigate. He spoke to my wife and I, and uh, I'm a, I've been a police officer for eight years. So I'm very well aware of the law, I'm very well aware with noise ordinances. And I spoke to the officer to make sure that, that hey, reassure him, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, this is what we're doing to be compliant. And there was no law enforcement action taken. So we had uh, received a complaint from animal control last May. And so I had went to my neighbors and I talked to them. I said, look, be honest with me. If Forrest is a problem, if you're hearing him different times of day, please let me know. Because if Matt has a complaint, I want to make sure that it holds merit. And none of these neighbors that I had talked to had any problem whatsoever with Forrest. And they said that they were willing to sign a statement uh, refuting the claims and uh, these neighbors we get over, along with very well. They don't have a problem with their dog. And I apologize to Matt, I'm sorry that it wakes him up, but I'm, if you'll notice uh, one question I might have for him is in his statement of complaint that I received a copy of, paragraph two, it says he wakes up at 5 a.m. every day for work. Well, our dog isn't let out till 6 a.m. So I'm just confused how Mr. Bentley is being woken up by Forrest when he stated his complaint that he's up at 5 a.m. Every, every day for work. Perhaps it's um, a nuisance for him in particular, but it doesn't seem to be that for anyone else in our community. Now, Mr. Bentley said that if he doesn't hear barking before 7 a.m., then he's good. Well, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. His schedule and our schedules do not allow that. But let me assure you that we are cognizant of our dog and what he does in our property at all times. We don't allow him to continue barking. We don't allow him to stay outside and roam and bark and bark and bark. Living in a community, we do have neighbors that that happens with. We have several on both sides of us that that seems to be the case, but it is what it is. We live in a neighborhood we've come to terms with. We will hear occasional barking. And we have a one-year-old daughter who's a light sleeper whose back window faces our backyard and if Forrest is out there barking, we're especially cognizant because we don't want our dog to wake her up and it doesn't. So if he's not waking up our one-year-old, then I, I don't see what the problem is here. Once again, I apologize to Mr. Bentley um, in, in the times that he's spoken to me via text or stopped by the house. I've assured him that we're doing everything we can under our care and control to 
keep watch over our dog to we'll give him we started giving him treats in the morning hey maybe we put a treat in his mouth maybe he'll stop but the barking is very sporadic it's not something that happens every day it's not something that you know if you notice from mr betley's uh affidavit of complaint you know he didn't hear him for two days three days one day and then 14 days he didn't hear him and all throughout his complaint second page there were two months where he didn't hear him and the last time I heard from Mr. Betley was in May. So from May until June, almost seven months, there was no issue. So I just want to show here there that this isn't something that happens every single day. Uh, you know, Forrest isn't out there every single morning barking every single time. And please refer to Mr. Betley's statement reaffirming that this is a very sporadic issue. Um, so I, you know, hey, I love Forrest. He's a member of our family. We take great care of him. I want to make sure that we continue to be respectful of our neighbors, um, but also please understand that he's on a very strict schedule. Uh, it's, you know, try to teach a new dog new tricks, try to teach an 11-year-old dog a new habit. I, I don't know what to tell you there. Uh, he needs let out a certain time. He needs let out before I go to work. My wife takes care of our baby, so she is unable to adjust her schedule. She's taking great care of our one-year-old and my responsibility is the dog in the morning and I'm always responsible for him to make sure that he is uh, continues to be well-mannered, continues to be disciplined and continues to be in compliance with uh, Anne, Arund Anne Arundel County um, code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Dell. Uh, any commissioners have any questions for Mr. O'Dell? I don't have a question, but I would just like to say to both uh, Mr. Bentley and Mr. O'Dell. Um, however, this turns out. Thank you both for your service. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, you. You honor the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Dell. I I do have one question. Um, I it sounds like when um, you let. Um, when you let your dog forest out in into the yard to go to the bathroom um is it uh, your habit that you're, you're standing there with him the entire time when he's out in the yard when i let him out i'm out on the porch with him and i'm cognizant of what he's doing and i'll, I'll switch it up sometimes i'll be out in the yard with him sometimes i'll be standing on the porch mm -hmm. to see if it's cold morning <laughs> i'm not gonna go walk in the yard but you know, being a disciplined dog, regardless of if he's five feet from me, two feet from me, or 15 feet from me, he hears my voice. And if he's 20 feet away from me and I say no, he knows no. So um, I, I vary it up. You know, some I'm, I'm in the yard. Sometimes I'll let him out the front, you know, with Mr. Belly's noise complaint. Sometimes I'll let him out the front and he might bark in the front once. He might bark in the back once. I try to switch it up. Um, but I am cognizant of what where he is, what he's doing. And he's only outside for approximately... 10 minutes or so to use the bathroom before he wants left back inside. And, and dogs bark, but do, is there any trigger? Do you know that there's something specifically that he's barking at in the first thing in the mornings? No, no, ma'am. The only thing um, with the German short hair breed, the only thing I can think of is it might be a territorial thing is I'm going to run out there and woof and assert my dominance and that's it. And it's not something that continues. He doesn't woof, sniff around and then start woofing again. Um, and, and with the discipline thing, you know, because I don't know when it's going to happen, sometimes he'll go out there and won't woof. You know, I give him discipline if he starts to stop that behavior, but I can't predict when he's going to decide to bark once or twice. I mean, he's, he's a dog and a well-behaved one at that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. O'Dell? Mr. Bentley? Uh, yeah, uh, Ben made some good points. Uh, only a couple of things I'd like to comment on in my affidavit. It said I, I used to wake up at 05. That was before the lockdown that went into effect. So I haven't been up at 05 since 13 March, 2020. Um, also, there were times where a couple months would go by where I didn't hear the dog. Like I said, it's been intermittent and, and it feels like since this process initiated, he's he's paid extra attention to to Forrest, and, and it has gotten better. Um, that I, I I won't deny that at all. 
And I also can't explain uh, why other neighbors don't hear it. I, I mean, maybe I'm a light sleeper. I, I, you know that, but but if you look at the times that I've logged in, this isn't me creating an issue that doesn't exist. Uh, you know, I just want to make sure that that that's clear. Um, thanks, Miss Belly. Anything else, uh, Mr. O'Dell? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, um, we moved to the neighborhood three years ago. And the pandemic started about a year ago. So there was a two year period where Mr. Bentley was, uh, had been complaining about our dog. He had started complaining shortly after we moved in, which means that his complaint stemmed from uh, the previous two year period in which he was waking up at 5 a.m. And if you'll notice from his, his complaint, and I have text messages that show that he repeatedly says that he's being woken up, yet he states for the two years of his complaint that he's been up at 5 a.m. every day. So. I can merely speculate, perhaps he hears Forrest and is annoyed by him, but you know, I, I apologize for that, but that's not, not something I can control. I can only control my dog and his behavior. Okay. Mr. Belly, like Bond or? Well, well no, again, it, it, the, the, when Mr. When the Odell's moved in, the issue was them letting him out at night, you know, 10.30, 11.30. There were a couple instances at one in the morning, uh, just even this past the Valentine's Day, Forrest woke us up at 2.34 in the morning. Uh, but, you know, th those, were, those have become one-offs. The big issue since the pandemic is, uh, yeah, again, because being home, our sleep schedules changed. And, and now, you know, we, we weren't getting up until like 7 a.m. Uh, and, and since the pandemic started, the issue here has been letting Forrest out, you know, anywhere from 548 to 612. That's really kind of the range. Uh, and then the only other thing I'd like to add is that uh, Mr. O'Dell stated that he hasn't heard from me since last May. Well, that was because his final text to me was that this issue is over as far as he was concerned. And he made it pretty clear to me that uh, there, there was no further discussion to be had, which is why I sent several warning letters uh, last year about it before I had to take this step. Because again, I, I was trying to, to to handle this at the lowest level possible before I had to take it here. Okay. All right, does anybody have anything else before we uh, break to deliberate? And I, I'd like to add one thing is, I will honestly drop this whole thing, uh, you know, I guess kind of speaking directly to Ben, if, if it can continue, like, you know, you continue to make the efforts that you seem to be making. I, I will drop this whole thing and we will go on our merry way. You know, we do have to live in the same neighborhood. Go ahead, Mr. Riddell. Matt, thank you. And I'll remind you that we continue to be very responsible for our dog and ensure his, his compliance, but I cannot control uh, your reaction to that. And for the commission, please refer to the 10 statements from neighbors assuring that this is not a problem. I apologize to Mr. Bentley. However, our dog needs let out the same time every day. Our, nothing has changed. I, I can't explain why in the, for a seven month period, he hasn't heard our dog when he's been on the same schedule. He's been doing the same thing. Um, I, I, I can't speak to that. I've reassured Mr. Bentley and the reason we stopped communicating is because um, he was reaching out to us repeatedly and repeatedly I assured him that we're watching over him. We're very careful over him. And frankly, I, I didn't know how much to reassure someone um, before, you know, just dropping it all together. And instead of getting nasty with Mr. Bentley, I just decided to drop the issue. I wanted to be respectful. And um, obviously I, I please refer to uh, the police officer, the responding officer to the call, please refer to his statement and please contact him and, any of the neighbors that I listed, if you have any uh, questions or wish to corroborate this. All right, Mr. Bentley. Yeah, got? regarding uh, the, the police action that I initiated, um, at, at the time, I knew Chief Altamari, and he's actually the one that I approached when this became an issue. And he's the one who put me in touch with Corporal Brookman. Uh, and Corporal Brookman did speak with Mr. O'Dell. And Again, because I, I didn't want to pursue this, believe me, uh, at the time, Mr. Brookman did offer to have, mediate between Mr. O'Dell and myself. 
But again, that, that turned into another one of those periods where it seemed to significantly get better. And I chose to just drop it at the time. That's why there was nothing done regarding uh, the issue back then. Because the, the step would have been to have a mediation between myself and, and, and Ben. And when the barking got better, I just dropped it again. Okay. All right, so if there's no more questions from the commission. I have uh, one question for Mr. Batley. Okay. Um, Mr. Batley, uh, I realize that your complaint centers around, you know, being jolted out of uh, a sleep early in the morning. Uh, are there any other effects uh, that this is having on you or any other member of your household? Well, I mean, it wakes my wife up as well, but, you know, she's able to go back to sleep pretty easily. I, I am not so fortunate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, break for deliberation here. You guys can answer any further questions that we may have, but otherwise we're just going to deliberate. So uh, start with uh, Ms. Rienzo. What do you think about all this? Um, I First of all, I have questions about um, Stephanie's opening comment. Um, at the beginning of this, you mentioned um, that any, and I, I don't want to misquote you, maybe I misunderstood it, but basically any disturbance is a nuisance. Um, and that was a little difficult for me to swallow. Um, I not guess. That any, not that any disturbance is a nuisance, that there's no time frame set on it. Um, that if there's a, a barking situation, these noises. Right, at two in the afternoon, it's considered a nuisance. Um, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's okay, not a time so frame. Is that what was, um, I, all right, so that's what kind of, um, I, I mean, I'm sure what she said is true. Um, gosh, I have a real issue with that, um, though, because, um, first of all, I have two senior dogs, um, and I understand you can't, when they're seniors, um, you can't always control when they need to go out. It's easy to say, well, we'll just keep them in the house till after 7 a.m., and that fixes the problem, and that's great if I want to be mopping up the puddles on my floor. I don't think that's healthy for the dog. I don't think that's um, good for us. Um, I'm also, I guess, I also, um, and I know this is like totally irrelevant, but you know, I run a trucking company and so, and my trucking company borders residential neighborhoods and we do have, you know, noise restrictions that we have to maintain. So while I am all about maybe trying to keep things quiet, maybe keeping the dog in the house between certain hours, I think the nine to seven that um, Mr. Bentley is asking is a little excessive. That's even longer than what general construction noise um, is required to keep quiet. Um, and considering that we have kids in this county that get on school buses at 6 a.m. in the morning, um, you know, keeping it, making sure that you hold your dog in your house after your kids go to school. I don't know. I, I just thought that the time requirements were a little excessive. If we are allowed to set a time requirement, I would be, um, I don't even know if we are because I just, well, I'm not so sure what else you, well, I'm not sure what clear. else you can do besides, I mean, what do you muzzle the dog when he goes outside? I just. Well, to be clear, what we're doing here is we're actually just going to vote whether to uphold the citation or to dismiss the citation here. We're not looking into any sort of like, it's not, it, it's a different type of case than we were in before. So we're not okay. So any, any recommendations or anything like that. We're either going to vote that yes, this animal is causing a disturbance and we're going to uphold the citation or we're going to say that, you know, that it, that it does, it's, you know, it has not come to that level for us and we're going to dismiss it. Then I have then I have two questions. Um, one, if you uphold the citation, what does that entail? Is this dog now like marked for life, like a like a child in the foster so care? So if if it, if it continues, there is a escalating uh, monetary value to the citations moving forward. We have the ability to lower the citation to anything we want if we want to uphold the citation, so it it stays on record. We could lower the monetary amount to a dollar. Um, you know, and just say, pay the citation, therefore it, it, it's in the record, but therefore if there's a second citation, if he brings another citation, there would be an increasing value, you know, face value to the next one would increase from 50 to, I don't know if it's 150 or $100. I don't have the documentation in front of me, 
but there's a escalating number as they keep as they would keep coming essentially um but that's it i mean they can you know because this is a citizen's affidavit they can kind of keep bringing if the issue remains and they feel like it that that's you know that's kind of how this is dealt with this is different than animal control bringing the charges this is citizen versus citizen okay um and then my second question was um is there a definition? I mean, has this ever actually risen to the level of case law or something else I can look at that tells me what disturb the quiet um, means? Because life in general disturbs the quiet um, in any neighborhood at any time of day. I mean, if, if I take the authority that a bark at 2 p.m. can disturb the quiet, um, then every time I go to the grocery store, I've disturbed the quiet. So I was just looking for a little bit more definition. Um, I think we're pretty loose on that and that's what's hard and that's what I was trying to say as well is that trying to describe what is a nuisance or problematic for one person versus another person. In previous cases we've had um, people bring evidence, again they're not required to do this, but we've had people bring evidence of video of the duration and intensity of barking. Some people have measured decibels from inside their home um, and this is, all, so there can some quantitative or qualitative reference of of where how that's what I was trying to ask how is this barking happening how long is it going on um you know trying to understand the the quality of this bark of like what when is it happening and how long is it is ongoing because dogs will bark and and to your point um what is a tolerance to one intolerance to one person and, and annoyance to another person um it, that, that's really tough with this kind of case um, to, to try to figure out. And that's what my question direction was trying to understand um, some of the documentation, but there's no duration of incessant barking um, to kind of help me in a decision. And um, that's where my questions usually try to go on, on a noise because there's, it's not about a time frame, which he had, it's about, um, does this seem like this is really, um, you know, a nuisance and, and we have to be the judge judgment that, you know, but we don't, it's very hard because it's something that is um, relative to each person. And, um, yes, but we're trying I to find no out doubt this is a new yeah. to um, Mr. Yeah. Bentley. No, no, no doubt at all. And I, I don't mean to, to minimize that in any way. I, I wouldn't want him to, I, I wouldn't want it to seem like I'm saying it's okay for him to be disrupted in his home. I'm just not sure how, as humans, we live together without some level of nuisance. So I didn't know if there was like a certain level it had to rise to before. I don't know. I'm going to stop talking now. No, I just don't know if we have it. Um, I don't think that it's spelled out in, um, real specifically to help us measure it. I think we just sort of hear the story and try to understand what's happening and try to go from there. But to your point, there's not like a... Um, like an escalating level of like how much barking, how loud is the barking, when is the barking, like how is, I try to get those questions, but there's nothing written in stone about, you know, and we try to understand what's the specifics of this situation um, to the rest of the panel. I, I don't know that I'm just saying that, I mean, I think that's in the couple of years on the panel of like how these cases usually go. We try to, that's what we try to figure out is, you know, what, what's going on and how, and mostly how can the neighbors, I mean, we don't offer a solution. This is a fine or not a fine of $50. Yes or no. I mean, that's where we are, but oftentimes we try to help. We're sort of little mediators in the community. We'd like to see them work it out themselves. They want to work it out themselves. We can't really give them any recommendations. Sometimes we do as an antidote, but basically what we're trying to do is figure out a measurement if this is, um, you know, intolerable and that there's something that could be done or, you know, if this is, you know, basically $50 fine or not, and that's, um, but it's, it's, it can be tough, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll stop. And, and <laughs> I think personally to this case, I mean, and I'll start, I mean, I, I went last, last time, other than, you know, I asked Ms. Brands, I, I would say in this case, I mean, it seems like the, the complainant has already said that he thinks things are getting better. He'd be happy if no money was issued at this point. I mean, my personal opinion is I'd be happy to drop this at this point. And, you know, if it continues, he has the option to bring it back up again and, and we can always adjudicate it that way. But it sounds like the issue has been, has gotten somewhat better and he seems happy with that, you know, that situation there. We, could, I, we do have the affidavits from, from other neighbors that say it's not an issue, which also corroborates that, it, you know, other neighbors aren't being bothered by it. Um, and um, I had one other thought. Um, and yeah, I mean, so basically, and that's that's kind of where I am with it. I mean, with those two kind of things there, and with the fact that even the complainant is saying that things have gotten better, 
I don't see any issue, you know, the issue to push it any further, even, even dropping it to a dollar and doing that. I don't even see the net, the need for that here. Um, but that's my personal opinion. So anybody, you know, we've heard from Stephanie and Jennifer, uh, Matthew, if you'd like to chime in at all. I completely agree. You just basically said everything I was going to say, given that the complainant doesn't find it to be such an issue and the affidavits from nine people, I'd be willing to drop the citation as well. If I could echo back on Matt, I, I think the owner, Mr. Odell, has taken reasonable steps and measures and has gone out of his way to try to prevent this dog from barking at 6 a.m. as best okay. that they can. And, okay. I, and I would, I'm inclined to dismiss the charge. Gotcha. Ed, do you have anything to say? Yes. Um, I uh, agree with uh, basically the the outline everything everybody said uh one thing though that that i am kind of sensitive to is uh and and believe me i have nothing but respect for both of these men um they are upstanding guys the complainant mr betley uh is a proud ex-marine who served over in um, iraq i believe his sensitivity to this may be related to his service time um you know if he was over there with ammunitions uh you know and shells blowing up uh while he tried to sleep um he may be a little bit more sensitive to trying to sleep as he as he stated uh his wife can just simply roll over and go back to bed but but he can't and it, it i can't help but feel um, that that could be a reason that he is more sensitive to this than should be. Um, it's like a, maybe a car backfiring at 6 a.m. when somebody goes to get up uh, to Jennifer's point. Um, you know, there's going to be a little bit of noise 24-7, uh, you know, because people work 24-7. Uh, if you're close to a road, you're going to hear a car a car noise, uh, you know, and you're you're going to hear maybe I'm out here. I, I hear a, a, a foxes bark sometime <laughs> where I am, and and crows call early in the morning, you know, uh, and and that's fine. But the bottom line is the the uh, the burden of proof is on the complainant, and I really don't think that he made his case. Uh, I really don't think he made his case. Um, I would have loved to have heard it, but we don't need to hear it because they said he goes out and he barks maybe once, maybe at, at most, maybe three times. Okay. Um, I agree. It's, it's an annoyance if you have a soft sleeper like Mr. Bentley said he was. And I can understand why. I feel bad, you know, that, that uh, you know, maybe some, um, you know, I, I don't want to tell people what to do, but maybe some earplugs, maybe some something uh, like that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I don't see where, where uh, uh, Mr. Odell should be fined. I don't think it's a finable offense. And uh, I think it should be waived, like Tom said, waive it, not even a dollar, uh, waive it. And if the problem, certainly Mr. Bentley uh, is aware that, uh, that Mr. Odell is not, uh, uh, you know, he, that he doesn't appreciate this. It's like an alarm clock going off every morning between six and seven, and he doesn't like to get up until seven. Eh. You know, we're talking about an hour. So um, I'm all for uh, dismissing the, the, the charge and hoping that the two of them uh, can work with the understanding that Mr. Odell can understand as he is, I believe, a Capitol Police officer uh, and an ex-Marine. They should be able to work things out uh, between them. I agree. Um, I would also, one final point I'd like to make just to, just to kind of put out there is, you know, obviously it showed that um, that uh, Mr. Bentley is willing to, to go this far to, to 
you know, take him to court for this. And like you said, things are better. And I think it's fine. So before, you know, I'm going to ask for a motion now, but I think that, you know, all those things taken into consideration, I think I'd feel comfortable dropping it. So I'll ask for a motion. I'll make the motion to, to, uh, dismiss the, uh, charge. Okay. Uh, second. I'll second it. Thank you. All right. All in favor. All right. Unanimous. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. This is first chance being a commissioner since, oh, I don't God, it's been a long time. I, like right, right off the bat when I came in, I had to help do this. I feel a lot more comfortable now. Um, we adjourn for the day. We do need to um, uphold the minutes from, when was the meeting, Phil? Why can't you continue, Tom? <laughs> so See, the, the minute my meetings- My problem is, what's that? I'm gonna, so go ahead. Oh, sorry, the minute meetings from last, or the, yeah, the minutes from last time, um, you would have to have a physical copy Okay. To, to have everyone sign off on them. So um, oh, okay. I'll have those to you now that I know that you're going to be uh, acting chair for at least the next one and we'll do okay. the vote next time. That's and fine. then we'll have everything moving forward. Gotcha. Okay. And so just, just before we adjourn then for the day, like I said, you know, since everyone's sitting here, um, I don't mind, you know, acting as commissioner for some time. I do, um, you know, there's going to be some months in the next two or three months. I know that I'm not going to be available. Um, we're going to have a replacement on my end. So you know, I definitely would implore the commission now that you kind of see how this is run, you know, even if I go through a few of these, you know, I definitely would, would um, implore you guys to, you know, consider um, one of our senior members, either Ed, or I know we, Elizabeth wasn't here today as, a, as an option. Um, at least, you know, I'm not sure how long everyone else's terms are, but um, is there any other questions before we adjourn for the day? That's great That's to meet everybody. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet you all. So, all right, uh, I guess that'll be it. So, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Tom. Huh? All right, I give a second and a third. Second. All right, everybody, have a nice day. Thank you. Hi, guys. Nice, nice to meet you all. Nice meeting you. Have a good one. Thanks. Goodbye. You too.